So tonight we want to pick up with chapter 1 and verse 12, where the author says this, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. Now, when the author makes that statement, he is not using hyperbole here. If you read what this man experienced and what he accomplished with his life, it is no exaggeration to say, I set out to know everything that is done under the sun. If indeed the author is King Solomon, the man had it all and he did it all. He was wealthier than anybody you and I know. He experienced every joy and pleasure and accomplishment that life can possibly provide. We will look more at that in our next lesson. But he did it all. He said, I set out with intentionality. I purpose to apply my wisdom, the God-given wisdom that he had, and all of his abilities to go and do everything. He didn't sit around wasting time watching television. He didn't sit around wasting his time doing anything. He pursued all that life could bring. He interacted with foreign uh, leaders of state. That's why he got so many of those wives of his. He built great things. His estate was, was massive. He had relationships with all kinds of different people. He built the temple, of course, and his palaces. He did it all, and he did it with gusto. And he admits up front, I set out to do this. This was a choice to explore everything that goes on under the sun. And here's his conclusion. It is a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. I have seen all the works which have been done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity. So after trying it all, after doing it all, after accomplishing so much, he comes back to the conclusion, all of it is vanity. Now last week, we considered that vanity, the Hebrew word used here, is the word for breath, or vapor. He said everything is just a mist. It's there for a second. You can see it. But then it vanishes and it's no more. <laughs> Even that, you're not going to be wet very long. It's just, <laughs> it's just a, a breath. Just a quick shot. And you can see it, and there's substance there, but then it evaporates into nothing, and there's nothing left. All of it, everything he sees, everything he set his mind to do, comes back, and it's just a, just a whisper, just a breath, just a vapor. Then, he uses another metaphor to describe the futility of everything. It's a phrase that recurs through the book of Ecclesiastes. He calls everything a striving or a chasing after wind. That is a great metaphor. Have you ever tried to, tra to chase the wind? Have you ever run after the wind? Have you ever been like I've been on a couple occasions where I've had a file folder full of papers walking across the parking lot? And in my clumsiness, I open the folder and the papers fall out and it's a windy day and suddenly my, my papers are blowing every which way. Now if I knew how the wind was blowing, if I could predict where it was going to go, I would simply set a course and go systematically and pick up every piece of paper. But of course, you have no idea where the wind's going to blow and you look like an idiot out there because you're stepping on a piece and you're trying to pick it up and then you're running over there and stepping on a piece and by the time you get a couple of them, the wind is taking them all over the place and you have no idea where it's going because the wind doesn't have a course that it follows that we can predict. And to chase after the wind is a complete exercise in futility. Jesus uses this same phrase when he's speaking with Nicodemus. 
and he's explaining to Nicodemus that people don't just choose to be born again. The Spirit is the one who gives the new birth. And the Spirit, Jesus says, goes where He wants to go and does what He wants to do. You can't predict it. You can't conjure it up. You can't order the wind. The wind just goes and that's how the Spirit operates. We see the effects of the Spirit. When someone comes to faith in Christ, we know that the Spirit has been at work. But until someone comes to faith in Christ, we cannot be certain that the Spirit is going to bring that person to the new birth. I, someone told me just the other day that uh, someone he's close to, the Lord's working on and he's convinced he's right there, he's going to come to faith, he just knows it. it's just a matter of time. And that may be true. It may be that there is evidence in this person's life that the Spirit is working. But we must be careful, Jesus says, because this, this is the Spirit's business and it's unpredictable. You cannot simply assign a formula to it. And he, the metaphor that Jesus uses is the wind. The wind blows where it will. You see the effects of it. That's how the Spirit works. That's what the writer of Ecclesiastes here is saying is all of life as I see it and as I have experienced it, it's like chasing after the breeze. You have no idea where it's going. You have no hope of actually achieving your desired end of catching the wind. It's a vapor. It's a mist. It's as futile and meaningless as chasing papers across a parking lot when the wind blows. Now, think about all that we do. We do, do, do. We are busy people. Busy, busy, busy. Our date planners are chocked full. Our calendars are full. Our to-do lists are full. On and on it goes. Think about all the work and all the activity that we are engaged in on a day-to-day -day basis. Think about a homemaker, a wife and mother. Laundry. Think about laundry. The hamper is full. The laundry basket is full. And so the wife takes the full hamper down and she dumps it out and she spreads all the, the clothes out and puts them in their appropriate categories. The, the hots and the colds, the warms and the colors and the brights and all this. And it separates it into their, their proper piles and then opens up the lid, plops in one pile, puts in the soap, gets the water going, and around and around and around the, the swisher goes as it cleans it. Then, when it's done cleaning, she comes and she takes it all out and puts it in the dryer, which goes around and around and around and dries it all, and she adds a new load to the washer. And she does this all day long until finally she's got a nice big pile of clothes again that have to be separated. And the underwear goes here, and the socks go there, and the jeans, and the t-shirts, and some are hung. And she puts everything away. And she looks back after all that day's work, and she goes, Phew, I'm done. The laundry is done. <laughs> the problem is, of course, she's wearing clothes, and her husband's wearing clothes, and her kids are wearing clothes, and all those clothes at the end of the day are going to go in the hamper and start the process all over again. And the next time laundry day comes around, she's got to do more laundry. Or dishes. Clean dishes. Now my wife loves to do dishes. You know, she's also the one who loves to put things on her to-do list just so she can check them off. She loves the satisfaction of having a, a sink full of dirty dishes and then having cupboards full of clean dishes. But she can't ever sit back and put her hands back and hey, dishes, they're done. Because as soon as the next meal comes, we're going to have a sink full of dirty, dirty dishes again. I experience this every summer. I get out on Saturday morning, my, my weed whacker, and I go whack those weeds, and I clear off around the bricks and around the bushes and all the hard to get places, and then I get my mower and I push my mower around, and when I get done, I look back and think, that looks pretty good. You know, I put the burgers on the grill and I sit there and I observe my fine work and think, that grass looks really nice. Sometimes I do, you know, angles instead of just the boring round in circles, <laughs> and, uh, and I do all kinds of things to make it look a little bit different, a little attractive, and I'll drive away the next day going to work or something, and I'm like, that looks really good. Until about the third day. And then it starts looking a little long again. And weeds and dandelions start creeping up. And I know come Saturday, I'm going to have to do it all over again. Even preaching. 
when I get done with the sermon, I have, I have prepared all week, or sometimes for multiple weeks, hours and hours and hours of my life spent reading over a passage, reading what other people have written about the passage, studying the original languages, looking at commentaries, looking at cross-references, thinking through illustrations, praying about and, and focusing on bringing something on Sunday morning that will benefit the people of God. And I go home on Sunday afternoons, and I'm tired, but it's in a satisfied tire. It's, I preach the word today. Lord, use that to change people's lives. This is what you've called me to do. This is great. I wouldn't do anything else. And Monday is my day off, and it's a day that I try to set my mind on other things than ministry and, and the Word, and that lasts until about noon. And then this little voice starts speaking to me again, Sunday's a-coming. Sunday's not very far away. You've got to have something to say to these people worthwhile on Sunday. You have a responsibility to teach the, God, the Word of God on Sunday. And so my mind goes to the text I'm going to be preaching on next Sunday. And Tuesday, I start the process all over again. The work is never done. There's always more to do. And if I were Solomon and were contemplating there being nothing beyond the sun... If I were looking at life under the sun as if that's all there was, all of these tireless repetitions would drive me to despair. Why do anything? Why get up in the morning if all I'm going to do is the same thing I did yesterday and the day before and the day before and I don't ever get anywhere with anything? All of our activity, all of our business, all of our work in our places of employment. If there's nothing beyond the sun, it's just chasing after the wind. It's just a vapor, a mist, and then it's gone. Now he goes on to explain his consideration of work in verse 18 of chapter 2. He says, thus I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun. For I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the fruit of my labor for which I have labored by acting wisely under the sun. This too is vanity. Therefore, I completely despaired of all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun. When there is a man who has labored with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, then he gives his legacy to one who has not labored with them. This, too, is vanity and a great evil. For what does a man get in all his labor and in his striving with which he labors under the sun? Do you realize what he's saying here? I've spent years, decades of my life building up this large estate, accomplishing all these things, making alliances with all these uh, other foreign kings. I've built this temple and this palace, all these things I've done, and I'm going to turn him over someday to some knucklehead who's going to waste it all. Some kid that likes to wear his jeans 12 sizes too big and hopes to, uh, to be a professional video game player when he gets big. He says, I don't know all this that I've done. Someone else is going to have it. And I don't know if they're going to use it with wisdom, if they're going to maintain what I've created, or if by some horrible choice in investing, it's all simply going to fade away. All his life's work, all of his effort, floating away, burning down, dissolving into nothingness. He looked back and said, I hated the results of all of my efforts because I'm going to have to give it to somebody else. There's no lasting, substantial benefit from all the work then, he says this, because all his days, his task is painful and grievous. 
Even at night his mind does not rest. This too is vanity. Work is hard. Sometimes it takes its toll on our bodies. Some have jobs where they work physically, manually, outside, and it wears and tears down the body. And it's painful. Others sit at a desk most of the day, but there equally comes pain with such a job. But it's the next phrase that catches my attention. Even at night, his mind doesn't rest. The man who is trying to find purpose and meaning and satisfaction in his work, after working hard for 12, 14, 18 hours throughout the day, comes home and he can't sleep because he can't get his mind off of his job because it's consuming him, because it's never done. He never accomplishes what he needs to accomplish. There's always more to do. This afternoon I googled work-related stress. Almost 16 million articles came back with that search phrase. You know what I'm talking about. You've experienced it or you know other people that have. There are big corporations that have full-time employees that do nothing more than deal with the stress levels of their employees. People go home at night and they think and they worry and they fret and they get ulcers and they get migraines and then they pursue unhealthy lifestyles because they're so consumed with their work. They don't eat or when they do eat, they don't eat healthy food. They stop by whatever is quick and eat you know, those 95 grams of fat hamburgers and, and fr french fries and Diet Cokes or regular Cokes this big. And they take up bad habits like smoking and drinking to excess and, and they're just, they're, their lives crumble because of their stress about work. Retirement. I've got to save more and more and more for retirement. I've got to put my kids through college. And on and on it goes. And they come home at night and they don't rest from the day. They don't put their feet up and think, okay, I did a good day's work today. I can enjoy some other things and rest. No, they're consumed, preoccupied with the next day's work or what they didn't get done the day before. And this permeates our culture. It spreads through everyone and everywhere in all of our industries. And even back thousands of years ago, before all of the sophistication that we have, the writer here says, even at night, the man who works doesn't find rest. See, there is nothing new under the sun. We are still struggling with the same things that people have been struggling with for thousands and thousands of years. Chapter 4 verse 4 and 5, he continues with his theme and his analysis of work. He says, I have seen that every labor and every skill which is done is rivalry between a man and his neighbor. This too is vanity and striving after wind. The fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. Now if you have the New American Standard, you'll see that in, in italics it says the result of, but that's not in the original. He's not saying that, uh, the, that all of this is a result of rivalry. He's saying that all of this produces rivalry. It's the word envy. When one man works and has a certain level of success, his neighbor sees that and becomes jealous. By nature, people don't like it when other people succeed. Instead of standing back and admiring and saying, wow, that's impressive. We say, that's not fair. I want a share of that. This is how it works in certain systems of government. Those rich people, bad. And corporations, bad. They make a lot of money, shame on them, that's bad. We've got to take money from those rich, mean monsters, the big corporations, and give it to the poor people. It's sort of the Robin Hood syndrome. But what happens? What do you think the corporation's going to do as the government continues to tax the big corporations? What are those big corporations going to do as they have to pay more money to the government? 
they are going to pass it right along to the consumers. And so this poor guy that's complaining, sitting around, as the writer here says, folding his hands in jealousy of those who are getting rich, ultimately it will cost him more to buy products from the big corporation because they're going to pass that right on to the consumer. So this guy is sitting back, jealous, envious of someone's success. And as the writer says, he consumes his own flesh. Or a more modern analogy would be, he shoots himself in the foot. But the point is, what is it that caused the poor man to desire the rich man to suffer? He's jealous. He's envious. And so now the pursuit of wealth and working to be successful not only causes internal despair for the, the worker, but now on the horizontal plane, man to man, neighbor to neighbor, there's fighting, there's bickering, there's jealousy, there's envy, because one person wants what the other person has. And Solomon says, this is all just striving after the wind. There's no benefit to all of this. There is no positive outcome to all of this. It's all simply just a mist, a vapor, and then it's gone. Oh, but we work and we collect money, and money is a good thing. Money will make us happy, right? Look what he says in chapter 5, verse 10. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. When good things increase, those who consume them increase. So what is the advantage to their owners except to look on? Last week we talked about John D. Rockefeller. And I mentioned to you that he's the richest man probably to ever live. Certainly the richest American. He was worth in today's dollars $310 billion. The story is told that someone put the question to him, Mr. Rockefeller, how much is enough? I mean, can you spend $310 billion in one lifetime? At what point are you going to cease in your pursuit of wealth? And do you remember what his response was? One dollar more. And then, of course, when he gets that dollar, Mr. Rockefeller, is that enough? No, no, just one dollar more, and then one more, and then one more. There's no satisfaction. No one ever stops. They want more and more and more and more. And as he says so wisely, when good things come, those who consume them increase. Can you imagine the kind of money that Bill Gates must spend on protecting his assets? Accountants fees, lawyer fees, he pays a lot of taxes, Suddenly he has a lot of cousins that he never knew that he had. And on and on it goes. There are plenty of people happy to help him do something with that money. And so now he's got the burden of dealing with all of that. And in verse 12, a recurring theme here, the sleep of the working man is pleasant whether he eats little or much. But the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep now, maybe he's talking about the very rich foods that the wealthy man can afford, but I don't think that's what he has in mind. The rich man lays awake at night, concerned about his riches. What if the stock market crashes tomorrow? What if my bank goes under? Sure, the government's going to guarantee a few hundred thousand of that, but I've got billions. What's going to happen to all those billions? What happens if I investments that I, that I made on a hunch from my financial planner turn out to go south and it keeps him up at night and he can't get any sleep because he's worried about his money. There is a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun, riches being hoarded by their owner to his hurt. When those riches were lost through a bad investment and he had fathered a son, then there was nothing to support him. And as he had come naked from his mother's womb, so will he return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Exactly as a man is born, thus will he die. So what is the advantage to him who toils for the wind? 
Throughout his life, he also eats in darkness with great vexation, sickness, and anger. You've heard the phrase, you've probably used the phrase, can't take it with you. I can't take it with me. Maybe you've uh, heard the analogy, uh, the imagery that uh, communicates this so well that there's, you've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. Now we say that, and those phrases roll off our lips, and everybody, even your atheistic neighbors, would admit, you can't take it with you. So why do so many people live as though they could? When the driving, motivating factor in their life is more, 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 more. The author here is very real. I was born naked. I'm going to die with nothing. I can't take anything into the next life. Simply, we return to dust and that's it. So why do we live this life consumed with great vexation, sickness, and anger, and jealousy, and envy, and ulcers, and work-related stress, and drunkenness, and deep depression, all of these things which characterize our culture. Why? When they know they can't take it with them, it still drives the acquisition of wealth and things and their pursuit of more and more work. Workaholism, that's a new word. That is not a word that was around a hundred years ago. But it was a concept. It was still a disease over a hundred years ago because it's inherent to the nature of man to do this. And Solomon says, it's all striving after the wind. It's futile. It's meaningless. It's purposeless. Unless. Chapter 5, verse 18, he gives the hope. Here is what I have seen to be good and fitting, to eat, to drink, and enjoy oneself in all one's labor in which he toils under the sun the few years of his life which God has given him, for this is his reward. Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. There are some who experience wealth. There are some who enjoy work and actually find some amount of pleasure and reward in them. But do you see where Solomon draws the hope and the contentment for such a person? It's not in this life. It's not in the work. It's not in the wealth or the pleasure. It's a gift from something or someone beyond the sun. It's a gift of God. To enjoy your work, to enjoy your wealth, is a gift from God. What is the nature of the gift? Is it the stuff? No, it's not the stuff. The gift of God that allows us to enjoy these things is the gift of understanding that there is something beyond the sun. Remember when we talked last week, I, I gave the uh, quote from C.S. Lewis where he said, aim at heaven and you get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you get neither. If you have the ability to set your sights on that which is beyond the sun, if you have a, a great ambition to be there, and all of your treasure is there, then God's gift to you is, between now and then, along the way, as you work, as you experience some growth in your portfolio, you can actually enjoy it and not lay awake at night and not have ulcers, and not have to go see a psychologist because of your work-related stress. Solomon says that is a gift of God if you can find some degree of satisfaction here. And the only way anybody is going to truly do that is when their sights are set not here under the sun, but beyond the sun. 
God made us to work. But God is the one who gives meaning to work. Have you ever thought about why we work? Why do we do all these busy things that we do? It's because we're made in the image of God. God works. He worked. In fact, he worked six out of seven days, which is more than we can say for some Americans. And Jesus, when he came on the scene, said, I work. I have come to do the works that my Father has given me. Work is not an evil thing. Ben, work is not a part of the curse. It's not part of the judgment on mankind. There was work prior to the fall of Adam and Eve. In fact, after God made Adam, he put him in the garden, and he said, cultivate it, tend it, take care of it. In a word, work it, and produce fruit. And he said to Adam and Eve, as a husband and wife, I have work for you to do as a couple. I want you to populate this planet with little Adams and little Eves who will work the soil all across the globe. Do you know the three times when it says that man is made in the image of God, the emphasis of what that image is? Go rule the world and subdue it. There are lots of other aspects to our being created in the image of God. The, the ability to think, and self-consciousness, and righteousness, and all those things. But inherent to man as created in the image of God is to labor and work and toil to bear fruit in life. That's because God worked and he told us to work. Work is not evil. It's a good thing. It is a way that we honor God. But as soon as we get our sights set on the work and off of the God who made the work, we are going to find ourselves going down the path of despair. And that's true whether we're talking about work 40, 60 hours a week or doing laundry. We are to work for the glory of God, not because we love work. Paul knew this. He knew the dangers of being preoccupied with and consumed with work and with wealth and pursuing these things. And this is what he wrote to young Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, he said, But godliness is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we can take nothing out of it either. You think maybe the Apostle Paul read Ecclesiastes? I think he did. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now Paul has just raised the stakes. When we are consumed with work and with acquiring more wealth, it can shipwreck our faith and bring us to reject the things of God and pursue the idol of mammon. That's pretty serious business. And the love of money and the love of wealth, he says, drives people to that. But then he tacks on that phrase, and they have pierced themselves with many griefs. He's talking about all those other things that we've been talking about. The worry and the never resting and the discontent. Then he says in verse 17, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Here we have in this section the two issues we need to understand with regard to work and wealth. We must understand there is a God beyond the sun. And if we understand that, then we can experience contentment with what we have no matter how little it may be at times. Paul says, 
if we have food and a roof on our he over our heads, we'll be content. If we understand there's a God beyond the sun, then we should be satisfied with whatever we have. Because we know this life is not the end. This is not the full purpose and hope and destination for us. And I may suffer through poverty in this life, but three score and ten or so, and my life is done. And because of the gospel, I have the certain hope of eternal life in a place where the streets are paved with gold and where my Savior is creating for me right now this enormous mansion. So I don't need riches here to be content because of what awaits. But see, if you don't have that hope beyond the sun, you can't be content because all you have is what you can get here. And the other issue is enjoyment. If God prospers you, if God blesses you abundantly, it is a gift of God if you can enjoy it. And you will only enjoy it if you are not putting your hope in it. Did you catch that instruction? Tell those who are rich not to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. As soon as you expect to find gratification and fulfillment in stuff, you're going to lose. But if you realize, God has blessed me with this. There is a God in heaven who loves me and who provides for me and wants me to enjoy this. Then you are free to enjoy it. Because again, you're not looking at it as your source of hope and contentment. It's just a nice added blessing along the path until your three score and ten come to an end. And then you'll enter into the true joy, eternal joy with God. What an important command that is for those of us in America, even Christians, and especially Christians in America, not to fix our hope on things here, to enjoy what we have, but to be content with what we don't have. And he goes on and says, Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. If you have money, if you have wealth, enjoy it and give it away and share it with others and be a blessing to others. As the apostle here says, quoting Jesus, when you give to the poor, when you give to those that don't have, you are actually creating for yourself a storehouse in heaven. And the eternal life that awaits us. Oh, what a message this is for America today. They need to hear this. They need to understand that placing any significance in the stuff under the sun will lead them certainly to nothing but despair and hopelessness. But if they understand there is a God beyond the sun, then they can actually enjoy the stuff here in the meantime. And there is one other aspect that we need to quickly mention. Not only do they need to understand that there is a God beyond the sun, but they need to understand that God is their judge. And we will be judged, all of us, according to what we have done in the body, whether good or bad. And so we need to focus on what is out there, rather, who is out there, and use all the things He has given us and look at them through the lens of stewardship. The Lord has entrusted me with these things, whether how great or how small, He's entrusted these things to me, and I am to use them for His glory and for His honor. <coughs> An amazing statement toward the end of 1 Corinthians. Paul says, whatever you do, whether eating or drinking, do it all to the glory of God. Now we can think of men giving their lives for missions work. Think, well, that's the glory of God. We might look at pastors 
say, well, that could be done to the glory of God. But how do you drink a cup of water to the glory of God? Does he really care about my meal and about my drink? Absolutely, he does. And you can consume a cup of coffee and it either be to the glory of God or not. And if that's true, then you can mow the lawn and you can wash the dishes and you can do the laundry for the purpose of the one who exists beyond the sun. That is the call upon our lives. And that is the message, ultimately, of the book of Ecclesiastes.